Section 15 of A Budget of Christmas Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christy Luther. The Chimes by Charles Dickens. Fourth Quarter. Some new remembrance of the ghostly figures in the bells, some faint impression of the ringing of the chimes, some giddy consciousness of having seen the swarm of phantoms reproduced and reproduced until the recollection of them lost itself in the confusion of their numbers, some hurried knowledge, how conveyed to him he knew not that more years had passed, and Trotty, with the spirit of the child attending him, stood looking on at mortal company. Fat company, rosy-cheeked company, comfortable company. They were but two, but they were red enough for ten. They sat before a bright fire, with a small low table between them, and unless the fragrance of hot tea and muffins lingered longer in that room than in most others, the table had seen service very lately. But all the cups and saucers, being clean and in their proper places in the corner cupboard, and the brass toasting fork hanging in its usual nook, and spreading its four idle fingers out as if it wanted to be measured for a glove, there remained no other visible tokens of the meal just finished than such as purred and washed their whiskers in the person of the basking cat, and glistened in the gracious, not to say the greasy, faces of her patrons. This cosy couple, married, evidently, had made a fair division of the fire between them, and sat looking at the glowing sparks that dropped into the grate, now nodding off into a doze, now waking up again when some hot fragment larger than the rest came rattling down, as if the fire were coming with it. It was in no danger of sudden extinction, however, for it gleamed not only in the little room, and on the panes of window-glass in the door, and on the curtain half drawn across them, but in the little shop beyond. A little shop, quite crammed and choked with the abundance of its stock, a perfectly voracious little shop, with a maw as accommodating and full as any shark's, cheese, butter, firewood, soap, pickles, matches, bacon, table-beer, peg-tops, sweetmeats, boys' kites, bird-seed, cold ham, birch brooms, hearthstones, salt, vinegar, blacking, red herrings, stationery, lard, mushroom ketchup, stay laces, loaves of bread, shuttlecocks, eggs, and slate pencils. Everything was fish that came to the net of this greedy little shop, and all articles were in its net. Glancing at such of these items as were visible in the shining of the blaze, and the less cheerful radiance of two smoky lamps, which burnt but dimly in the shop itself, as though its plethora sat heavy on their lungs, and, glancing then at one of the two faces by the parlour fire, Trotty had small difficulty in recognising in the stout old lady Mrs. Chickenstalker. Always inclined to corpulency, even in the days when he had known her as established in the general line, and having a small balance against him in her books. The features of her companion were less easy to him. The great, broad chin with creases in it large enough to hide a finger in, the astonished eyes that seemed to expostulate with themselves for sinking deeper and deeper into the yielding fat of the soft face, the nose afflicted with that disordered action of its functions which is generally termed the snuffles, the short, thick throat and laboring chest with other beauties of the like description, though calculated to impress the memory, Trotty could at first allot to nobody he had ever known, and yet he had some recollection of them too. At length, in Mrs. Chickenstalker's partner in the general line, and in the crooked and eccentric line of life, he recognized the former porter of Sir Joseph Bowley an apoplectic innocent who had connected himself in Trotty's mind with Mrs. Chickenstalker years ago, by giving him admission to the mansion, 
where he had confessed his obligations to that lady, and drawn on his unlucky head such grave reproach. Trotty had little interest in a change like this, after the changes he had seen, but association is very strong sometimes, and he looked involuntarily behind the parlor door where the accounts of credit customers were usually kept in chalk. There was no record of his name. Some names were there, but they were strange to him, and infinitely fewer than of old, from which he argued that the porter was an advocate of ready money transactions, and on coming into the business had looked pretty sharp after the chicken stalker defaulters. So desolate was Trotty, and so mournful for the youth and promise of his blighted child, that it was a sorrow to him even to have no place in Mrs. Chickenstalker's ledger. "'What sort of a night is it, Anne?' inquired the former porter of Sir Joseph Bowley, stretching out his legs before the fire, and rubbing as much of them as his short arms could reach, with an air that added, "'Here I am, if it's bad, and I don't want to go out if it's good.' "'Odd weather, indeed,' returned his wife, shaking her head. "'Aye, aye. Yes,' said Mr. Tugby, "'I like Christians in that respect. Some of them die hard, some of them die easy. This one hasn't many days to run, and is making a fight for it. I like him all the better. There's a customer, my love." Attentive to the rattling door, Mrs. Tugby had already risen. "'Now then,' said that lady, passing out into the little shop, "'what's wanted?' "'Oh, I beg your pardon, sir, I'm sure. I didn't think it was you.' She made this apology to a gentleman in black, who, with his wristbands tucked up, and his hat cocked loungingly on one side, and his hand in his pocket, sat down astride on the table-beer barrel, and nodded in return. "'This is a bad business upstairs, Mrs. Tugby,' said the gentleman. "'The man can't live.' "'Not the back attic can't!' cried Tugby, coming out into the shop to join the conference. "'The back attic, Mr. Tugby,' said the gentleman, "'is coming downstairs fast, and will be below the basement very soon.' Looking by turns at Tugby and his wife, he sounded the barrel with his knuckles for the depth of beer, and, having found it, played a tune upon the empty part. "'The back attic, Mr. Tugby,' said the gentleman, Tugby having stood in silent consternation for some time, "'is going.' "'Then!' said Tugby, turning to his wife. He must go, you know, before he's gone. I don't think you can move him, said the gentleman, shaking his head. I wouldn't take the responsibility of saying it could be done myself. You had better leave him where he is. He can't live long. It's the only subject, said Tugby, bringing the butter scale down upon the counter with a crash by weighing his fist on it, that we've ever had a word upon, she and me, and look what it comes to. He's going to die here after all. Going to die upon the premises. Going to die in our house. And where should he have died, Tugby? cried his wife. In the workhouse, he returned. What are workhouses made for? Not for that, said Mrs. Tugby, with great energy. Not for that. Neither did I marry you for that. Don't think it, Tugby. I won't have it. I won't allow it. I'd be separated first and never see your face again, when my widow's name stood over that door, as it did for many, many years, the house being known as Mrs. Chickenstalker's far and wide, and never known but to its honest credit and its good report, when my widow's name stood over that door, Tugby, I knew him as a handsome, steady, manly, independent youth. I knew her as the sweetest-looking, sweetest-tempered girl eyes ever saw. And I knew her father, poor old creature, he fell down from the steeple walking in his sleep and killed himself. For the simplest, hardest working joyless hearted man that ever drew breath of life. And when I turn them out of house and home, may angels turn me out of heaven, as they wouldn't serve me right. Her old face which had been a plump and dimpled one before the changes which had come to pass, 
seemed to shine out of her as she said these words, and when she dried her eyes, and shook her head and her handkerchief at Tugby, with an expression of firmness which it was quite clear was not to be easily resisted, Trotty said, "'Bless her! Bless her!' Then he listened, with a panting heart for what should follow, knowing nothing yet but that they spoke of Meg. The gentleman upon the table-beer cask, who appeared to be some authorized medical attendant upon the poor, was far too well accustomed, evidently, to little differences of opinion between man and wife, to interpose any remark in this instance. He sat softly whistling and turning little drops of beer out of the tap upon the ground, until there was a perfect calm. When he raised his head and said to Mrs. Tugby, late chicken-stalker, "'There's something interesting about the woman, even now. How did she come to marry him?' "'Why, that,' said Mrs. Tugby, taking a seat near him, "'is not the least cruel part of her story, sir. "'You see, they kept company, she and Richard, many years ago, "'when they were a young and beautiful couple. "'Everything was settled, and they were to have been married on New Year's Day. "'But, somehow, Richard got into his head, for what a gentleman told him, "'that he might do better, and that he'd soon repent it, "'and that she wasn't good enough for him.' and that a young man of spirit had no business to be married. And the gentleman frightened her, and made her melancholy, and timid of his deserting her, and of her children coming to the gallows, and of it being wicked to be man and wife, and a good deal more of it. And, in short, they lingered and lingered, and their trust in one another was broken, and so at last was the match. But the fault was his, she would have married him, sir, joyfully. Oh, I've seen her heart swell many time afterwards, when he passed her in a proud and careless way. And never did a woman grieve more truly for a man than she for Richard when he first went wrong. Oh, he went wrong, did he? said the gentleman, pulling out the vent peg of the table beer and trying to peep down into the barrel through the hole. Well, sir, I don't know that he rightly understood himself, you see. I think his mind was troubled by their having broke with one another, and that, but for being ashamed before the gentleman, and perhaps for being uncertain, too, how she might take it, he'd have gone through any suffering or trial to have had Meg's promise and Meg's hand again. That's my belief. He never said so, more's a pity. He took to drinking, idling, bad companions all the fine resources that were to be so much better for him than the home which he might have had. He lost his looks, his character, his health, his strength, his fringe, his work, everything. He didn't lose everything, Mrs. Tugby, returned the gentleman, because he gained a wife. I want to know how he gained her. Oh, I'm coming to it, sir, in a moment. This went on for years and years, he sinking lower and lower, she enduring, poor thing, miseries enough to wear her life away. At last he was so cast down, and cast out, that no one would employ or notice him, and doors were shut upon him, go where he would, applying from place to place and door to door, and coming for the hundredth time to one gentleman, who had often and often tried him. He was a good workman to the very end. That gentleman, who knew his history, said, I believe you are incorrigible, and there's only one person in the world who has a chance of reclaiming you. Ask me to trust you no more until she tries to do it. Something like that, in his anger and vexation. Ah, oh, said the gentleman. Well? Well, sir, he went to her, and kneeled to her, said it was so, said it ever had been so, and made a prayer to her to save him. And she... Don't distress yourself, Mrs. Tugby. She came to me that night to ask me about living here. What he was once to me, she said, is buried in a grave, side by side with what I was to him. But I have thought of this, and I will make a trial, in the hope of saving him, for the love of the light-hearted girl, you remember her, who was to have been married on a New Year's Day, and for her love of her Richard. And he said 
he had come to her from Lillian, and Lillian had trusted to him, and she never could forget that. So they were married. When they came home here, and I saw them, I hope that such prophecies as parted them when they were young may not often fulfill themselves, as they did in this case, or I wouldn't be the makers of them for a mine of gold. The gentleman got off the cask and stretched himself, observing, I suppose he used her ill as soon as they were married. Oh, I don't think he ever did that, said Mrs. Tugby, shaking her head and wiping her eyes. He went on better, for a short time. But his habits were too old and strong to be got rid of. He soon fell back a little, and was falling back fast, when his illness came so strong upon him. Oh, I think he's always felt for her. I am sure he has. Oh, I've seen him in his crying fits and tremblings, try to kiss her hand. And I've heard him call her Meg, and say it was her nineteenth birthday. There has been lying now these weeks and months. Between him and her baby, she's not been able to do her old work. And by not being able to be regular, she's lost it, even if she could have done it. How they have lived, I hardly know. I know, muttered Tugby, looking at the till, and round the shop, and at his wife, and rolling his head with immense intelligence. He was interrupted by a cry, a sound of lamentation, from the upper story of the house. The gentleman moved hurriedly to the door. "'My friend,' he said, looking back, "'you needn't discuss whether he shall be removed or not. He has spared you that trouble, I believe.' Saying so, he ran upstairs, followed by Mrs. Tugby, while Mr. Tugby panted and grumbled after them at leisure being rendered more than commonly short-winded by the weight of the till, in which there had been an inconvenient quantity of copper. Trotty, with the child beside him, floated up the staircase like mere air. "'Follow her, follow her, follow her,' he heard the ghostly voices of the bells repeat their words as he ascended. "'Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart.' It was over. It was over, and this was she, her father's pride and joy, this haggard, wretched woman weeping by the bed, if it deserved that name, and pressing to her breast, and hanging down her head upon an infant? Who can tell how spare, how sickly, how poor an infant? Who can tell how dear? Thank God! cried Trotty, holding up his folded hands. Oh, God be thanked, she loves her child. Again Trotty heard the voices saying, Follow her. He turned toward his guide, and saw it rising from him, passing through the air. Follow her, it said, and vanished. He hovered round her, sat down at her feet, looked up into her face for one trace of her old self, listened for one note of her old pleasant voice. He flitted round the child so wan, so prematurely old, so dreadful in its gravity, so plaintive in its feeble, mournful, miserable wail. He almost worshipped it. He clung to it as her only safeguard, as the last unbroken link that bound her to endurance. He set his father's hope and trust on the frail baby, watched her every look upon it as she held it in her arms, and cried a thousand times, She loves it! God be thanked she loves it! He saw the woman tend her in the night, return to her when her grudging husband was asleep and all was still, encourage her, shed tears with her, set nourishment before her, he saw the day come and the night again, the day, the night, the time go by, the house of death relieved of death, the room left to herself and to the child. He heard it moan and cry. He saw it harass her and tire her out, and when she slumbered in exhaustion, drag her back to consciousness and hold her with its tiny hands upon the rack. But she was constant to it, 
gentle with it, patient with it. Patient was its loving mother in her inmost heart and soul, and had its being knitted up with hers as when she carried it unborn. All this time she was in want, languishing away in dire and pining want. With the baby in her arms she wandered here and there in quest of occupation, and with its thin face lying in her lap and looking up in hers, did any work for any wretched sum. A day and night of labor for as many farthings as there were figures on the dial. If she had quarreled with it, if she had neglected it, if she had looked upon it with a moment's hate, if, in the frenzy of an instant, she had struck it. No. His comfort was. She loved it always. She told no one of her extremity, and wandered abroad in the day lest she should be questioned by her only friend, for any help she received from her hands occasioned fresh disputes between the good woman and her husband, and it was new bitterness to be the daily cause of strife and discord where she owed so much. She loved it still. She loved it more and more. But a change fell upon the aspect of her love. One night she was singing faintly to it in its sleep and walking to and fro to hush it, when her door was softly opened and a man looked in. For the last time, he said, William Fern. For the last time. He listened like a man pursued, and spoke in whispers. Margaret, my race is nearly run. I couldn't finish it without a parting word with you, without one grateful word. What have you done? she asked, regarding him with terror. He looked at her but gave no answer. After a short silence he made a gesture with his hand, as if he set her question by, as if he brushed it aside and said, it's long ago now, Margaret, but that night is as fresh in my memory as ever twas. We little thought then, he added, looking round, that we should ever meet like this. Your child, Margaret, let me have it in my arms. Let me hold your child. He put his hat upon the floor and took it, and he trembled as he took it, from head to foot. Is it a girl? Yes. He put his hand before its little face. See how weak I'm grown, Margaret. When I want the courage to look at it, let her be a moment. I won't hurt her. It's long ago, but what's her name? Margaret, she answered quickly. I'm glad of that, he said. I'm glad of that. He seemed to breathe more freely, and after pausing for an instant, took away his hand and looked upon the infant's face, but covered it again immediately. Margaret, he said, and gave her back the child. It's Lillian's. Lillian's? I held the same face in my arms when Lillian's mother died and left her. When Lillian's mother died and left her? She repeated wildly. How shrill you speak. Why do you fix your eyes upon me so? Margaret. She sunk down in a chair and pressed the infant to her breast and wept over it. Sometimes she released it from her embrace to look anxiously in its face, then strained it to her bosom again. At those times, when she gazed upon it, then it was that something fierce and terrible began to mingle with her love. Then it was that her old father quailed. Follow her, was sounded through the house. Learn it from the creature dearest to your heart. Margaret, said Fern, bending over her and kissing her upon the brow, I thank you for the last time. Good night. Goodbye. Put your hand in mine, and tell me you'll forget me from this hour, and try to think the end of me was here. She called to him, but he was gone. She sat down stupefied, until her infant roused her to a sense of hunger, cold, and darkness. She paced the room with it the live-long night, hushing it and soothing it, 
she said, at intervals, like Lillian, when her mother died and left her. Why was her step so quick, and her eyes so wild, her love so fierce and terrible whenever she repeated those words? But it is love, said Trotty. It is love. She'll never cease to love it, my poor Meg. She dressed the child the next morning with unusual care. Ah, vain expenditure of care upon such squalid robes! And once more tried to find some means of life. It was the last day of the old year. She tried till night, and never broke her fast. She tried in vain. She mingled with an abject crowd, who tarried in the snow until it pleased some officer appointed to dispense the public charity, the lawful charity, not that once preached upon a mount, to call them in and question them and say to this one, go to such a place, and to that one, come next week, to make a football of another wretch and pass him here and there from hand to hand, from house to house, until he wearied and lay down to die or started up and robbed, and so became a higher sort of criminal, whose claims allowed of no delay. Here, too, she failed. She loved her child, and wished to have it lying on her breast, and that was quite enough. It was night, a bleak, dark, cutting night, when, pressing the child close to her for warmth, she arrived outside the house she called her home. She was so faint and giddy that she saw no one standing in the doorway until she was close upon it and about to enter. Then she recognized the master of the house, who had so disposed himself, with his person it was not difficult, as to fill up the whole entry. "'Oh,' he said softly, 